Good evening. We're here on our Wednesday night service that we'll have to, in a little bit here. And I know we're a little early. It looks a little light out here. But as we record this, we are just looking forward to a, to a good time of looking at Scripture. And since that we're approaching Easter and the things that uh, go with it and celebration of it, and it's an important time and one that uh, certainly is for Christians, it's, it's the peak of everything. It's our hope. It's what we place everything into because we're looking forward to a day and a time when we too will be resurrected to a new body, with a new body and mind, and be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forevermore. I want to look back for a while, and I know this is an unusual Easter because I know we're probably not going to be able to have an Easter service. Lord's Supper will have to be uh, delayed till we can uh, uh, have services again at some point in the future. All those things are going to have to be put on hold, but I, you know it's important now that we stay safe and and that we stay um, we don't lose anybody to the virus. So you guys wear your gowns and wear your gloves and your hats and your everything else that they want us to wear, and make sure that you're protected and stay inside. But at the same time, life goes on, and we look forward to. Uh, celebration in the future that will be uh, very important. Lead from Scripture, from Matthew chapter 21, it says, When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpaga, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples. And he said unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straight away you shall find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them, bring them unto me. If any man say on unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, in a colt, the fowl of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put, them in, <coughs> put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem and all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. As we take a look at this, and this is coming up Sunday would be Palm Sunday, one that's traditionally been where we celebrate his entrance into Jerusalem. But in all reality, it, it, uh, it's just important that we remember what it means that we take a look at it. And this is one that we look at, and from the time of this entry into Jerusalem and the time of his resurrection in, and, uh, from the dead is a period of eight days filled with with great love and yet with great uh, uh, and terrible things that occurred to our master. And so as we remember Palm Sunday and we look and look uh, at the triumphal entry into the city and we take a look and say, man, how they, you know, how they honored him. He rides into town on the colt of a donkey. In other words, he's coming in peace. It's been a tradition throughout history that when a man came in peace to before a city, a great leader, someone who was a king, he would ride a, a colt, he would ride a, a donkey, and he would come into the city riding that way. If he came in time of conquering and war, he would ride upon a horse. And the two would be noticed, and Christ comes in here riding on a donkey, and he is the king. He is the king of the Jews. So he rides, what rides on this donkey to signify to them, hey, I'm here in peace, and I'm here in love. Actually, I'm here to bring you comfort and freedom. And the significance of this event was not understood by his disciples till much later. With the benefits of hindsight, though, you and I can take a look and understand it better because we understand what's there. Y'all go with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. <clears throat> John 12, 16. 12, 16. And these things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered that they, uh, that they, these things were written of him and that he had done these things unto him. 
In other words, all of this is prophesied back in the Old Testament. And it was set forth that these things would occur and would happen. And they're prophesied because, so that we would know they're true. Keep in mind, I could go back in uh, my office and pick up my Hebrew Bible. It's translated into English. It's used by Jews all over the world. It actually is mirrors as a mirror of the King James. There's some rearrangements. The difference is where the books are placed, but the books are the same. Translation, almost all the way through it, is exactly the same. And the only translation, one of the only translations that's changed is in Psalms, where it says they shall pierce his hands and feet. And they've got a different translation there because they understood fully if that was true, and what they're saying here was true in that prophecy, then they crucified their king, which they did. And they also don't read Isaiah 53. And you know, it would be a good week to sit down and read through Isaiah 53 because it's a week that <clears throat> it's actually listed as to what was going to occur to our Lord and Savior. So when it comes to some of these things, the Jews today try and stay away from them because they do prove that Jesus of Nazareth was the king of the Jews and he was their Messiah, their Hamashiach. And so we, we see him, and, you know, in the preparation as he come about, you can look at it in Mark chapter 11, you can look at it in Luke, you can look at it in Matthew, because it's given in all three. And as you look, as they, as they drew near to Jerusalem by way of Bethany, and I'm sure that most of you would say Bethany, Bethany but it's actually Bethany in Hebrew, which means house of, of dates or house of affliction. The two have a, there's a word there that's translated either way, or Beth Pagal, the house of unripe figs. I know that these are little villages Today, they're pretty good sized villages. And they sit on the top of the Mount of Olives. And they kind of surround it, it's kind of a crown. And there's a, a place at the very top of it that there's a, a church built. And it's the uh, place of ascension, and tradition says. And so there's a marker that's built there with a huge tower to mark his ascension back into heaven. But actually here, as he comes up to him, he arranges for two disciples to go into Jerusalem to get the colt. <clears throat> Mark chapter 11, you know, again, or back in, uh, back in Luke or Matthew, I'm sorry, we find the same. He sends them into a village looking for an ass tied and a colt with her. He says, loose them and bring them unto me. So he, he's done this. I think sometimes we look and say, well, how nor would the disciples know which one? But it's an unusual happening to find these two tied there. And, and wouldn't the owner wouldn't he uh, have a, a problem with just somebody taking the ass and taking the colt or the donkey and the, her colt? And I, you know, I think this foreknowledge is involved here. One man said he thinks Jesus made prior arrangements with the owner. I don't think so. I think this is a foreknowledge of God and the working of God with this owner to let him take that colt. But they just simply tell him the Lord needs us <clears throat> and, uh, bring, and tells him to bring them unto me. So I think he comes in, there's a cult to which no one has ever sat before. And if you stop and think, there's some symbolic, symbolic, symbolism here that's going on. And this symbolism is a cult who is clean. He's never had anybody sit on him. He's riding a cult that actually should be broken first. And it's one that's clean. It's one that's also predicted. It's one that's prediction has been given in, in the Old Testament, the prediction has been made beforehand, and he goes out and gets the two and brings them in. He mounts the colt. They throw their, their, their outside garments on the colt so that it's covered. They place him on it, sits, sits him on it. Matthew mentions both animals, the mother and the colt. You know, that would be kind of a, a, a natural thing because the mom's along with a colt who's never been ridden. It would call on that colt and make them so that they would not uh, buck for do anything else. They begin to cut down as the crowd begins to gather. There's a place that said that this is where he came down. It's a road which leads from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem. Some of it's used today, some of it's not. But either way, they bring him down. He's sitting on the colt, and all of a sudden the people begin to come out. They begin to throng out. And they begin to throw their clothes in front of him as he begins to go. And this is actually an age-old custom of greeting a ruler or a king. Part of what's going to get him in trouble here with the Jews 
and with the Romans is he's looking and acting like a king. He's making all the, uh, the moves that would say he's a king which is coming to his city. Some of them to cut leafy branches from the palm trees that are there and they would throw them on the ground in front of him. This is again tradition and one that looks forward to bringing a ruler into, uh, into his uh, city. So it's a triumphal entry. It's, you know, it's one that, that you look at and say, it's, this is a king, he's a conquering king, and yet he comes in peace. He wants to enter the city that's there. And he should enter the city that's there in peace because it's his city. It's his city. The Pharisees and the ones who tried to chase him out and tried to set him up to be killed, it's not their city, it's his city. And in the future, it will truly be his city. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Did I say, I'm sorry, 2 Kings. I'm sorry, 2 Kings. I knew that didn't sound right. Uh, chapter 9, verse number 12 and 13. 2 Kings 9 and 12. Verses 12 and 13. And they said, it is false. Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus spoke he to them, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets, saying, Yea, who is king? In other words, what Jesus is doing, the Jews understood and saw from the Old Testament what is prophesied here. This is the king, king of the Jews. In fact, Pilate, in just a few hours or a few days, is going to put on a sign above his head in three languages, this is the king of the Jews. So as we look at it, it's one that's uh, very historic. It's one that is simply prophetic. In John chapter 12, John chapter 12, verse number 13, Jesus mentions the palm branches. Jesus said, verse, the tail end of verse 12 says that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Baruch Hashem Adonai, this one that comes in the name of the Lord. And it's a very common Hebrew saying, and one that's always linked to the arrival of the Messiah. And it was here too. They're looking forward to him being the Messiah. And of course, what would happen is in his crucifixion, it looks like he's failed. Only in his resurrection do some of them begin to see it's real. One of the other verses says they were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save or please save. It's a cry of the Lord to save us. It's given in Psalm 118, verse 26. You don't have to turn there, but the blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. One that says that we want you to save us. Verse number 25, save us. It's one that has been age old. And he enters into Jerusalem in Mark chapter 11. Go straight to the temple. He looks around. It's, it's a late, hours late, so he does not stay. So he returns back to Bethany. Or Bethany. He comes back with the 12, where he likely stays the night during the week until the Passover. Likely at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. In John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. John 12, 1 and 2. <clears throat> then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then Mary, then took Mary a pound of ointment of sp uh, spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And thus saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, because he was a thief, and he had the bag, he was the treasure, and bear what was put therein. And it said, Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing, hath she kept it? For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. So Jesus is getting again, once again saying, I'm going to die. 
I'm going to be buried. And Mary has done what she would always do with someone who is dead. She's anointed us, or anointed me rather, with oil in preparation for my burial. And she would later. But he's back in the home of Mary and Martha. Lazarus is there. Lazarus is one who's hated by the Jews because he's proof of who Jesus is. Jesus brought him forth on the fourth day after he was dead. And the Jews hate Lazarus because he's, in essence, a sign and a symbol of who this man is. You know, when you take a look at it, you, you see the, the fulfillment of prophecy. And that's what really uh, Matthew probably brings out. Go back to Matthew chapter 21 better than, than the rest. Matthew chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the fowl of an ass. Look back with me for a minute to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Let me just say to you that Zechariah is one of the most prophetic books in all of Scripture. Zechariah chapter 9. Verse 9, <clears throat> and here we says, Zechariah writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. He is lowly in riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fowl of an ass. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of earth. Now he's added, I add a little bit here because I want you to understand, Christ is coming into this city, and he's coming in peace. He's actually offering himself as their king, but they refuse him. They're going to refuse, not only just refuse him, they're going to kill him. They're going to put him to death. And it's a fulfillment of prophecy. And I, you know, I, I want to add to this, and I think many of you know, but in all reality, Zechariah was written over 500 years before Jesus came. And if you take a look at, again, at the Hebrew Bible, translated into English, this verse is the same. You don't have to take my word for it. You can look online. Most of you know how to get it. You can take a look at those translations, and the Jews have translated it the same. You ask them what, uh, you know, is this true? Is this Christ? Messiah? Yes, but Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Jesus is still to come. But actually, he's fulfilled it. And don't tell me that we've, that we've twisted and distorted things or we've written things different. If the Jewish Bible is the same as the, as the Christian Bible and the Old Testament completely, how could we change it? How do we get them to change theirs to ours? It's, it's just a proof that this is what it is. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1. Malachi 3, 1. And this is his short visit to the temple, but he says, Behold, I will send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And that day is, is then, it's a short visit. It's a quick visit. It's one that he comes in quickly. He looks around. He's arrived in the temple. He's there. He's there as, as the king of the Jews. And he leaves very quickly. So again, the prophecies are given. They're fulfilled in Christ. There's some 300 prophecies that Christ fulfills in the New Testament in his short span that he, that he was a, a prophet here. I know I'm not supposed to use that bottle, but I don't have much choice. And he's looking, saying that, you know, I've come to my king, kingdom, and the reality of it is what Pilate couldn't see, what a lot of the Jews couldn't see, his kingdom here is much different. Look at Matthew 11. Mark 11, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> Mark 11, verse number 10. Mark 11, 10. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
And Jesus entered unto Jerusalem and unto the temple, and when he looked around about all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So the actions that are done here, these, are, they were, these reflect the messianic anticipation which Christ was trying to, to make the Jews see and fill them with his anticipation. I would have to say personally, he's got to be in good shape. Because going back from the Temple Mount back to Bethany is a pretty good climb that he's got to make up that hill. And they make their way back up to the house of Mary and Martha. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse number 12. John 12, 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, cried, Hosanna, blessed be as the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, set thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Now the disciples don't understand what's going on. They don't know that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. John chapter 6, verse number 15. John 6, 15. They try to make him king. They've tried to do that a couple of times. And he, each time, he refuses. John 6, 15. He refuses because it's not the time to become a physical king because his, his kingdom is different in this case. His kingdom's still here. We're part of that kingdom. But it's a spiritual kingdom, one inside of us. It says, in fact, this is one of his miracles. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain and nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragment, fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained <clears throat> and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of truth, the prophet that should come into the world. And that's taken from the book of Deuteronomy. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again unto a mountain himself alone. And understand, it's not his time to become the physical king yet. It's his time to have a spiritual kingdom, which is one that, that uh, is inside of us. It is a spiritual kingdom. And it's looking, for, you know, they were looking for a physical king. I kind of think in 